Step aside, Brecht. Move aside, Godard. Diego Velasquez broke the fourth wall way before you guys. And no, he didn't do it in a standard portrait like Jan van Eyck or Hans Holbein. He did it in a full-fledged domestic painting of a royal family. Ladies and gentlemen, we present to you Las Meninas. Some people, however, still consider it a portrait, but even they concede that it's quite an unusual portrait. For one, you don't notice the stiffness usually associated with portraiture. Everyone is so loose, relaxed, and in their element. There's a warm intimacy to the picture. If you disagree and find it closer to portraiture, then there's a lot here that goes against that grain as well. So, what is it? Before we find out, if you enjoy our content, don't forget to like and subscribe. By 1656, Velázquez had been the chief court painter to King Philip IV for over 30 years. It was the highest honor for any artisan back in the day, and aristocratic families sought after him for intricately painted portraits. What do you do when you have that much clout? You flaunt it. He played hard and fast with conventions and broke rules because who's going to question him? There's a reason Diego Velázquez is remembered as one of the greatest Baroque artists, if not the greatest. Picasso, Dali, and Bacon all revered him and took inspiration from him. Francis Bacon thought that Velázquez's portrait of Innocent X was simply one of the greatest portraits ever, and many people shared his enthusiasm. To put it simply, the man is a legit icon. While he's known for plenty of great works, there's nothing more iconic than Las Meninas, which is interesting because the work did not garner acclaim during his life. This can be partly attributed to the fact that the painting hung in the king's private office and was not shown to the public. And it makes sense when you realize just how intimate a picture it is. It not only shows the entire family in a familiar and comfortable setting. Dogs in Western art often denote loyalty and friendship, but it's not just the casual attitude of the subjects that catches our eyes. There's also a sense of spontaneity to them. Just notice how many people look directly toward the viewer. Are they taking notice of someone? That is where we delve into the issue of the king's insecurities. As the king got older, his vanity prevented him from sitting for paintings. Velázquez, however, was able to convince him for a small part and, in the sneakiest of fashions, managed to squeeze him in the painting. Philip, however, was still not comfortable with showcasing the work to the public. The room we see here was in King Philip IV's Royal Alcazar Palace and belonged to the king's only son with his first wife. After the child passed away, the main room was awarded to the painter. The royal family gave him an unprecedented level of freedom when it came to art curation and interior design. So it makes sense that Velázquez set the painting in this studio where he adorned the walls with paintings of his choice, not to mention mirrors and tapestries. Just take a look at those paintings by Peter Paul Rubens, a personal hero of the artist, singing praises of the visual art. Now, painting did not have the same prestige in Velázquez's time as, say, music or poetry. It makes sense that there's so much going on in the room from the mirror and the canvas to the dog at the bottom, Velázquez wants to flaunt his skill and by extension make a case for the validity of painting as an art form. He painstakingly worked on the room to achieve this particular composition, and the whirlwind of energy it gives off is a testament to his genius. Most of this room was actually destroyed in a fire in 1734. The fire also damaged the painting, which was cut from both left and right. The work that survives today is still huge, to say the least, measuring 125.2 inches by 108.7 inches. To make sense of those numbers, it's as tall as the length of a ping pong table, and it is as wide as the length of a ping pong table. If you don't know how long a ping pong table is, well, it's about twice the length of an average pool cue. Now, if you don't know how long a pool cue is, maybe leave the house every once in a while. Getting back to the painting, imagine that originally it was even bigger than this, but size is not the only impressive thing on display here. The painting packs a bunch of mysteries that people have been discussing for centuries at this point. So let's take a close look. It depicts 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, and 11 royal subjects, excluding the dog. So it's not your average portrait. I mean, who is it supposed to portray? The king and queen's only surviving child at this point, Infanta Margareta Teresa. That could make sense as she takes the center stage and the artist's command of geometric perspective draws our eyes to her. 
Then you realize that she's the only person in the painting who stands alone. Everyone else is paired up with someone else. Two Meninas or court ladies attend to the girl, enhancing her stature in the scene. She grew up to marry Prince Leopold I of the Holy Roman Empire, which as they say was neither holy nor Roman nor an empire. On the right side of the frame, we see two dwarves, the left one a court official and the right one the jester. Behind them, we see the princess's chaperone talking to an unidentified figure, probably a guard. And way in the back, we have the queen's chamberlain. His placement is important from an aesthetic standpoint because his presence combined with the open door opens up the frame. Imagine a closed door with no one standing there. The background would have been flat and quite dull. There's also the mirror, of course, which adds another plane, another dimension, if you will. And in the left corner of the frame, we have Velasquez himself working on a canvas. It is quite unusual to see a painter looking at us while working on a canvas. We are placed in the shoes of a subject as if we were modeling for a portrait ourselves. But then you remember the mirror in the foreground, which tells us that we're witnessing the scene from the eyes of the royal couple. But if the royal couple is posing for a portrait, what is this commotion around them? But then, we might just be looking at the reflection of the canvas. Maybe the artist has been working on a portrait of the king and the queen. After all, the mirror is not in the center of the frame, it's slightly off-center, which helps this particular interpretation. But that introduces another question into the mix. If the king and queen aren't actually there, why has everybody suddenly started to turn in this direction? Look at the princess in the center. Her eyes have shifted, but she is in the process of turning her head. Look at the two court officials on the right, who stand with solemn looks in their eyes, as well as Velasquez himself, who moves away from his canvas to catch a glimpse. What about that guy in the back who thinks he's reached the end of the runway at a fashion show and has to make a sudden flamboyant turn? Maybe the royal couple has just arrived at the gathering, or better yet, intervened. Then there is the idea that what we see in the mirror is merely a specter, and that the painting foresees the passing of the couple and the growth of their child. What gives credence to this argument is the chaperone's mourning clothes. She quietly confides in the man's ear, whereas the Meninas are making sure that they cater to the princess's every need. Also, look at the potion she holds. The Bucaro, a Guadalajaran potion that the Spanish brought back from their expeditions in the New World, was quite fashionable for making one's skin paler. In 17th century Europe, Pale skin was the epitome of beauty standards, proving that the subject did not work outdoors. Since they saw it as a beauty-enhancing product in those days, it can be interpreted as a life-giving elixir. Could it be that the painter was hinting at the transience of life, the past in the reflection and the future in front of us? All these questions have made art historians rack their brains for centuries. The work's allure comes simply from the number of ideas inside the frame from the sheer creativity to drum up such an elaborate composition to the ingenuity to break all the rules. Are we the spectators or are we seeing through the eyes of the king and the queen? How about the sheer skill on display? As soon as we look closely at the technique, we start to notice that Velasquez has actually painted the entire frame in loose brush strokes, giving it an ethereal, almost dreamy quality. Critics have cited this work as an example of pre-impressionism, claiming that Velázquez was among the first artists to experiment with form in such a radical manner. Way before the likes of Eugene Delacroix, J.M.W. Turner, Edouard Manet, and John Singer Sargent. This work of art has been replicated by Picasso and Dali in their own style. However, Las Meninas remains an important part of Western art history. And for good reason. I mean, just look at it. It's mesmerizing. If you liked this video, please hit the like button. For more content, subscribe to the channel. What painting should we do next? Share your thoughts in the comments and we'll see you in the next one.